Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, friends, uh, uh, welcome to this uh, event. It's uh, uh, how can tax benefit systems support households through crises? Um, let me start by thanking you all for being here and also thank the uh, wonderful wider team for putting on putting on this uh, this event. <clears throat> Uh, of course, uh, led by Yuka, who you will Yuka Pirtila, who you will hear from, but uh, Anna and Maria and, and the whole team. Uh, thank you very much indeed. My thanks also to uh, our uh, panelists, uh, Joya Demelo from OECD and Marie Lebrand from University of Cape Town. Uh, unfortunately, Claudia, uh, Claudia Sanueza, uh, the Treasury Under Secretary uh, for the Government of Chile, will not be able to join us because she has been called away to a parliamentary uh, to a parliamentary meeting. <laughs> to discuss uh, uh, to discuss tax reform, in fact, uh, but uh, we'll have we'll have a good discussion uh, on on the issues. Let me just start by saying a few introductory words, and then then I'll hand over to Yuka <clears throat> for his presentation. So, how do we let's let's start by thinking about the following setup conceptually? Okay, we have a distribution of market incomes, which is generated in a complex, nuanced way, a highly context-specific interaction of formal, informal, et cetera, et cetera. There's some market distribution of income. And applied to this is some tax and transfer system, which itself is complex and nuanced and applying to formal incomes. And then there are transfer things, which are in, in different ways, cash and so on and so forth. Okay, And then the outcome is a consequence of the application of this, uh, of this uh, tax and transfer system to the market incomes that emerge from, from, from the operation of the, of the economy. So that's the, that's the structure that we have. How would we assess this situation? How would we assess the tax and transfer system, which is being applied to the market incomes to generate the consequences? Well, we can, uh, there, there's a tradition of analyzing these things, applying uh, optimal tax theory in, in economics, going back to Merleys and Atkinson and Stiglitz and so on. And what we need, we need at least two things. We need the objective function of the government, uh, how inequality averse is it? What does it think about poverty? What views does it have on gender, et cetera, et cetera? And we need a model of the economy. We need what sort of incentive effects might this tax system have? Uh, and how, does, how do the sectors interact, et cetera? Putting all of these together, we can make an assessment of the current tax and transfer system uh, as applied to the market structure, leading to the consequences which we evaluate using the government's objective function. And, you know, we do a lot of this, and I think economists do this reasonably well. Of course, there are gaps and this and that, and there are data issues, et cetera. But I think by and large, by and large, uh, we, we seem to do this reasonably well. Uh, the, the, as I said, there's a long tradition going back to uh, Merleys and Atkinson and Stiglitz and so on. But here's something that I don't believe, uh, or, or rather we've only just started thinking about over the last five, seven, ten years. It's what happens when there's a shock to the system? What happens when there's a crisis? Okay, This is different from health shocks, which are idiosyncratic and uncorrelated. We're talking about major economy-wide shocks to the system, which of course changes the market distribution of income. Okay? And we ask ourselves the question, what then? What happens then? Well, in, in, uh, in practice, uh, several things happen. Firstly, the system as it currently exists responds through its own rules, its own internal rules of operation, et cetera, et cetera. It responds. It has to respond to this, uh, to, uh, uh, to this shock, to this change in market, in the market distribution, the distribution of market incomes. But also, actually, new schemes are put in place because uh, perhaps the government realizes that there are gaps in the, in the existing system. Uh, in many countries, in countries like India, for example, these schemes are usually given the name uh, of, of the prime minister. It's called the prime minister's something or the other, or it's given the name of a, of a, of a, of a stalwart of the ruling party from the past. Uh, in India, it would be the Bajpai system, or if Congress was in power, it would be the Indira Gandhi system, and so on and so forth. But new, new schemes are also put into place. Okay, And this is the practical response. And there are consequences. So there's a shock, which changes the market distribution of income. The system responds automatically, but also new schemes are put in place. And together, we have a new set of consequences. And we might ask certain questions about this. We might ask, what are the features of a system which gives better consequences? Yeah, of course, we have to define what we mean by better, et cetera, et cetera. What is it about a system that gives rise to better consequences? Uh, uh, from the point of view of our, of our objective function. 
But the point is that these better consequences are, will always be crisis specific because the crisis has changed the market distribution in a particular way. Then we apply the system and new schemes and we get the consequences. What if the, what if the, what if the, concept, what if the crisis is something different? What if it's not a, uh, what if it's not a COVID type crisis, but it's a trade crisis or it's a refugee crisis, or if it's a this crisis or a that crisis, environmental, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Well, of course, then the system would have responded differently and the consequences would have been different. Can we think of a system? Can, uh, can we ask the question, could there be a system which addresses a range of crises reasonably well, in the sense that it re leads to consequences which are not, not as bad as they, other, as they otherwise would have been? So the optimal design of a system to address crises, to address a range of crises, becomes an important, interesting analytical question. And I think this is what we're this is what we're heading towards. This is what we should be heading towards uh, in this in this framework of thinking about uh, responses to crises. Now, you know, the wider project and many other uh, exercises that are going on are all contributing to the I think to this to this grand question that's being that's being asked. And I hope we're going to have a good set of discussions around this. What sorts of systemic responses should there be to crises whose origin we're not going to be we're not sure about entirely? Uh, whose timing we're not sure about entirely, but we know for sure that there will be a crisis of some sort or the other in the coming three to five uh, years or so. Just a couple of complications as well, which is, you know, in terms of government responding to these crises, the question of should the government put some money aside, uh, save for a rainy day in case the crisis arises? That sort of question. And secondly, what if individuals are themselves responding to these crises? How should the government's response then change? These are all complicating factors, which I think make the analysis very interesting, but also the policy, the policy issue uh, much more nuanced, much more complicated. So let me stop there. Uh, just as a, this is just a brief introduction. And let me hand over to Yuka Pirtala uh, to, uh, to make a presentation uh, on uh, following up on these things. Uh, Yuka, over to you. Thanks so much, Ravi. Thanks for providing that excellent um, uh, introduction to, uh, to also to, for my presentation. So let me just uh, follow suit and, and, um, and, and, and just reiterate the, uh, uh, what are the tax benefit, um, uh, what are the goals of a tax benefit system? So of course, I mean, one key objective is uh, to alleviate uh, long-term poverty. So to uh, offer social protection for those households who are who, who face uh, 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 adverse conditions uh, uh, in, on a long-term basis. But then, as Ravi said, uh, the tax benefit system should also offer... Yuka, uh, 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 do your slides need to move forward? They are not moving. No. Oh. Ah, yes. Now, 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 now we're on to the first slide, yes. Um, do they move now? Yeah, that, that, now we're okay. We have the tax benefit goals. The oh, slide to yes. edit tax benefit goals has just gone past and now, now we're on to automatic stabilization in developing countries. Oh, yeah. I'm seeing the tax benefit goals. Yes, slide. that's yeah. that's the one that's the one we have now. Sorry. Sorry, yes, yes. All right, sorry about that. Okay, so, uh, right. So, uh, so social, uh, the tax benefit system should also provide some cautioning against negative shocks. Uh, and these shocks can, for example, stem from um, economic crisis, which lead to unemployment. And then uh, the government can come in and, and, uh, and, and, and offer uh, uh, unemployment benefits uh, for, for some of the citizens. So this functioning can also be seen from the point of view of automatic stabilization. And what we mean by that is an automatic uh, increase in benefits or people becoming eligible for benefits and a reduction in taxes uh, when incomes decline. And uh, colleagues in the Southwood project of UNU Wider uh, have analyzed the, the extent of automatic stabilization in developing countries. So namely, Kwabena uh, uh, Adwa has a paper which examines this issue uh, uh, in uh, for three uh, Afri three developing countries, Ghana, South Africa, and Ecuador. And he calculates how well tax and benefit policies insulate households from this shock. So this insurance, if you wish, uh, can in principle range 
from zero to 100 uh, percent. If there's zero insurance, then whenever people face uh, shocks in the market incomes, let's say earnings, then also their disposable income declines in one to one. Minute. However, there could be, in principle, there could be also perfect insurance, uh, uh, meaning that a household's disposable income would stay constant despite uh, the market income uh, uh, decline. So here are the results uh, from the Adu Ababio paper on the extent of uh, automatic stabilization uh, in these three countries. And these are calculated for a, for a general shock of, of a 5% decline in, 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 in pre-tax incomes. And as you can see, uh, the uh, uh, social insurance offered by the Ghana system is very minimal. It's somewhat better in Ecuador and, and, and definitely uh, more sizable in the case of South Africa. But especially, I mean, the, the, the Ghanaian and the Ecuadorian uh, social insurance uh, policies are fairly small. And, and how do these compare with what we, what we know uh, uh, about the conditions in developed advanced economies? And, and here's uh, information about the EU uh, on average and the US systems from the DOL study done in the same way. And, and, and in, the, in the advanced economies, uh, the extent of social insurance provided is much more uh, 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 extensive. And, and really, I mean, similar results can be, can be uh, 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 obtained uh, when, when looking at this uh, coronavirus pandemic. So there was a wider study by, yes, the last one and my colleagues who analyzed them how how the uh, pandemic affected uh, uh, five countries in Africa. And again, the result was that the, uh, uh, that the social insurance provided by, the, by, these, uh, by, by, by these African um, uh, governments was very uh, modest, uh, maybe with the exception of them. So why do we have so little automatic stabilization in developing countries? So I think there are three key reasons. The first is a simple one, uh, and it's related to the fact that the government size, and hence the level of taxes and benefits, it's much smaller in developing countries uh, than they are in, uh, in, in, in developed economies. The second reason is that the, uh, there's a large share of workers who work for the informal sector, hence they don't pay any tax. And if their incomes decline, the tax which they don't pay can't go down, basically. And the third reason is that the many benefits are not means tested against income. Rather, they are based on what is often called a proxy means testing, uh, which means that the eligibility for benefits is based on asset indices. And, and, and calculating the eligibility requires data collection uh, in order to, for the systems to reach uh, new recipients. Let me now move on to discuss uh, whether there could be reform options uh, uh, so that there, there would be better uh, social insurance offered uh, by the developing economies. And as Ravi already alluded to, uh, 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 public economics has a conceptual frame, framework stemming already from the work from early 1971 uh, in, in the, uh, along the lines of optimal tax work. And there, a key result is that other things equal, uh, the, the chosen redistribution by the government should be increased uh, whenever the pre-tax income difference is increased. If society starts to put a greater value on, on equal distribution of incomes, or for some reason, the negative impacts of taxation on economic efficiency uh, are reduced. Uh, together with Ravi and Miao, uh, we examine uh, using the Berlian setup uh, how the Zambian uh, uh, tax and benefit system should react to shocks, and if the shocks indeed lead to a greater pre-tax income inequality, then also the redistributive capacity uh, of the government should increase. There's also a question uh, not only about the extent of social provision uh, for protection, but also about the type uh, uh, offered. And this is related to how 
how well targeted uh, social protection policies should be. In the developing country context, if gross incomes are difficult to observe, as they presumably are, uh, then means testing against income is not possible, but rather the countries can use more targeted uh, uh, transfer systems, which are, for example, of this PMT proxy means tested type. Or in principle, they could also have more universal systems uh, um, uh, covering certain demographic groups, like households with older persons, or, uh, or in principle, also everyone. And that would be the case of a, of a universal basic income, UBI. And we think that there's a trade-off. So in normal circumstances, if you like, Targeting works well because for the for the given uh, uh, money that the government needs to use for the system, it, it if the if targeting works well, it's it's meant to minimize the uh, the poverty or maximize poverty reduction. But in the case of shocks, uh, uh, if the profile of the of the needy household changes dramatically or drastically, uh, then Original targeting is not any, any more necessarily uh, optimal, and if it's if it's difficult to swiftly change the targeting, then this could be a case uh, towards a, a move towards a more universal system. And in ongoing work, again with Ravi and Adnan Sahir and, and, and Pierre Rattenhuber of UNUI, we examine this, this this issue in the Ethiopian context. And I think we, our results already indicate uh, that the increase in the Ethiopian uh, uh, poverty numbers would be smaller when shocks hit uh, under a more universal system than under the present more targeted system. So let me conclude. Better social insurance system requires uh, resources, requires government revenues so that the tax side uh, cannot be ignored. And of course, it also requires the capacity to implement these transfers, which is not an easy task. Uh, the desirable scale of the cushioning is, is likely uh, much greater than the existing one offered by many countries. And, and one could also consider moving towards more universal systems, especially if these shocks appear to be uh, large and if they hit frequently. And I'm stopped there and, 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 and hand it over back to you, Ram. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yuka. If you could remove the screen share, yes, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, Murray and Joy, if you could if you could come back onto on the screen, uh, we have two great uh, panelists to uh, uh, to comment and discuss and give their own experience and the benefit of their own research on this. They can comment on whatever it is that they want to comment on, what I've said, what uh, Yuka said. But I thought it might be useful for them at least to touch on the following two questions in this first round of exchanges, which is given their country experiences, how well did the existing systems cope in protecting the poor when, when, a cri when crises hit? And secondly, whether it's good or bad, how, what, do the, what features of the present system explain whether they did well or badly? So if they could speak to that, but you know, speak to whatever it is that you want to speak to, then we can get a discussion going. Joel, why don't you, why don't you start? Okay, sure. Uh, well, good afternoon, good morning for some, and uh, thank you very much for this invitation. It is, it is an honor to be participating in this panel. And uh, I'd like to mention that I couldn't agree more with uh, most of uh, what Yuka and Ravi have mentioned. So I'll just try to complement it. And just mention that my uh, I work at the C Center for Tax Policy. So my area of, 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 of expertise is in tax, uh, but I'll try to, to complement and, and, and also touch other uh, issues that are related from the point of view of the design of the benefit system. Uh, so, uh, as we know, the pandemic has had a, a biggest uh, in, uh, has had a big impact in poverty. It has led to the biggest increase in poverty in the last decades, and also it has widened uh, inequality. 
And this has happened despite unprecedented fiscal packages because governments, both in developing countries and advanced countries, uh, it, try to uh, support households and businesses significantly. Of course, these packages varied in terms of uh, the country's fiscal space, and it also varied in terms of the pre-existence of uh, automatic stabiliz stabilizers, as uh, Yuka mentioned. So uh, one thing that I think it comes uh, clear from the experience of this crisis, but that it was also already known before, is that tax transfers are crucial to protect households during crisis, even much more than uh, tax relief, right? And this is even more so in countries where uh, there is informality. And transfers, as we know, they are especially important to, to, to reach the low end of the distribution. Uh, so uh, I think this, this uh, pandemic has uh, shown the importance of transfers. Otherwise, the, the, the impact on poverty would have been much worse. Uh, but even so, even in, in OECD countries, which I, I know a bit more the experience, uh, OECD countries uh, relied a lot on, on job retention uh, schemes to prevent mass unemployment, but then they also had to, to, to rely on direct transfers to households, as there are many workers that are not covered by uh, social insurance. And then there was this need to, to, to identify the, 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 those in need. Uh, and in, in a timely manner, that, that's the problem in, in crisis, you need to do things fast. And that has been also uh, the experience in, in developing countries. And I think that some uh, lessons from this crisis is that, well, uh, there is a huge importance of, of social registries. Those countries that already had a very good developed uh, social registry managed to do better. There is an, uh, uh, also it's very important to have efficient payment uh, delivery systems. And it's also important to be able to communicate well and reach uh, those who, who are, who are uh, hidden uh, in the population and we don't know where they are and to, to, so that they are aware that there are new transfers uh, for them to help them. Uh, and so in this sense, I think like uh, coming back to Yuka's presentation, I think the fact that, that we know that uh, the pandemic showed that there is a need to identify uh, the vulner vulnerable quickly uh, because the response needs to be immediate. And that has uh, revived this debate uh, between uh, targeting and universalism. And uh, we know that targeting is cost-effective uh, given fiscal constraints, and that's the advantage. But then if uh, vulnerable people move in and out of poverty, uh, then uh, targeting fails to protect them. And this is even harder when there is a crisis because things change quick. So I think this is uh, what Yuka was saying that in, in, the, in the presence of a shock, then there, there might be a case for uh, a universal, um, univer universal uh, responses, right? Uh, and this, this discussion between targeting and universalism also has been uh, has existed previously, and it's very linked intrinsically the, linked to uh, the, the levels of informality that uh, countries face. Uh, because as we know, in, in developing countries where, uh, where there is a high rate of informality, uh, the middle income of the distribution uh, usually is not covered by, uh, by non-contributory schemes because they are not poor, but if they are informal, they are not covered uh, either by uh, social insurance. And this phenomenon is called as the, is, is referred to often as the missing middle, right? Uh, so we can argue that universalism in, in, in this context would not, would not face this limitation as everyone would be covered. But the, the biggest problem, as we know, is that uni universal programs, if we provide adequate benefits, then they are extremely costly. So I do share, and I think that this is uh, among uh, across many international organizations, there is some uh, uh, agreement that uh, universal programs might be uh, <clears throat> more effective if they are uh, if they focus, well, more effective now, but they're less costly and they much more uh, uh, justified if they focus on specific groups such as the, the children or the elderly. And there is also the, this um, view that universalism 
is, a, is expected to achieve better outcomes where, where most of the people in countries where like, there's a, a big share of the population that is, uh, that is vulnerable or poor. <clears throat> so I think overall, I think there is a consensus on the need of providing universal social protection floors in terms of the normative aspects, but there is not really, I, in my belief, uh, there is not really a consensus on how to achieve these floors in terms of the design of, of the benefit system. And there is neither a, a clear solution of, on how to finance social protection financing gaps. And I would like to also mention briefly another crisis that has been affected in all the world, which is which are energy, which is the energy crisis, and their governments uh, have have had to support uh, households and businesses to ensure that they can afford energy and also uh, food. Um, and in this case, in this case, there have been also uh, tax measures that have been introduced, and also non-tax measures as, as subsidies. Most countries have been introduced initially tax measures, and then I would say that high income countries have introduced more non-tax measures like transfers uh, also to compensate. I, in terms of counting how many measures, it will, it, it, one could argue that uh, high income countries have also, uh, and have also introduced many transfers and are gradually shifting towards transfers. And uh, ideally in this case, it makes sense to, to focus on targeted transfers as universal transfers would be extremely costly, but also you know, you know, tax measures that benefit the whole population can be very unequal. And they are also uh, muting this uh, signal uh, in terms of prices that we need to transition to, to carbon neutrality. But what I would like to, to, to highlight from, this, uh, from the energy crisis is that in this case for transfers, it has also shown that even the most sophisticated uh, fiscal systems may not be ready for, for, for uh, identifying uh, the, tar the, the specific groups. That, that has been also the case in Germany. Uh, when you need to identify specific groups that it's not only about income, but it's also about uh, regions or uh, availability of alternative uh, transportation modes, uh, then even the most advanced uh, fiscal systems are challenged. So I think this crisis has also uh, highlighted the importance of data. And basically to, to sum up, I think uh, shocks are here to stay. They are the new normality. And uh, then this means that social protection uh, is, uh, is needed more than ever. And so to achieve uh, greater resilience to crisis, I think, Definitely, we need a significant uh, domestic resource mobilization, and in particular, increase in tax revenue, increasing tax revenues. But this is not, there, there, we need a new social contract, as the Chilean government has argued uh, for their tax uh, uh, reform. That that means that uh, citizens must agree to pay more taxes because we agree that there are increased uh, spending needs, for example, for climate change disaster. But this cannot be done magically. We need to increase trust in governments to manage to convince people to pay more taxes. And we finally, I would think like uh, we need to reform the transfer system. That seems to be clear, but we need to design uh, non-contributory schemes, not only non-contributory schemes, but we need to reform the whole social protection system uh, in terms of the pension system so that it's, uh, it, they, are, uh, they, they are coherent, right? And finally, I would like to really uh, emphasize the, the need for better data, irrespective of what type of benefit system we have, we will always need more data to identify those in most need. Thank you. Good, well, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Joya de Melo, uh, OECD, of course. Uh, we now turn to our second panelist, uh, Murray Lebrand of the University of uh, Cape Town. Uh, take it away, Murray. Thank you, uh, Ravi. Um, and uh, I will bring the South African experience to in this first round to uh, to this this discussion, uh, just as an example of of what uh, both uh, Yuka and Jo have been saying about the fact that actually the um, the context matters a great deal in terms of what the optimal 
uh, combinations are and what the art of the possible is. And so obviously when COVID arrived, we were all caught short in terms of a well thought through plan for a pandemic. And I guess part of the, 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 the purpose of today's discussion is to, to extract learnings and to see, okay, but how can that not happen again? Um, but when, when COVID arrived, it arrived into a South African society that, as you all know, has, has extremely high inequality, uh, a poverty uh, rate of about 50%, just over 50%. Um, and the bottom half of the South African uh, income distribution is characterized by pretty weak links to the labor market. Uh, the, the, the bottom 30% are, are dependent upon a very um, extensive social protection system focused on the elderly and the young. So not anything in particular for the working age population. Um, and, and then the, 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 as you move up the income distribution, the, the, the links into the labor market strengthen, but uh, up until the 50th percentile at least, uh, it's characterized by, by access to informal work that need not necessarily be uh, informal sector, but, but casualized work within the formal sector. Um, and, uh, and that's the society we have. And, and uh, if you overlay that uh, with the reality of, of the lives that people live, uh, you know, uh, the, the vulnerable are, are often in informal settlements or in rural areas. And would, would it, we knew ex ante would battle greatly to cope with a lockdown. It was almost, you know, if you think as a policy person about your society and the people that, you know, the impact of this COVID pandemic, um, and then you're asking people to lock down and stay at home, and they're living in an informal settlement with very uh, uh, weak access to, you know, uh, to tap water and to electricity and um, et cetera. Anyway, so that was the context within which uh, COVID arrived. And what's also distinctive about COVID, of course, was, was that the concern was the labor market shock as well. As Ravi was saying earlier, this is not exactly the same thing as a drought, uh, you know, or, or an agricultural shock. It was the shock to the labor market. So, so, so what was the policy response and, and how did we get there? So, uh, you, you know, uh, February, March, 2020, we're looking at the society and looking at our data and working out, okay, what can we do to protect those in the labor market? We're locking down, we're stopping the economy. What are we going to do? And um, the, the responses were as follows. Uh, to some extent, the formal sector workers that were well integrated into unemployment insurance, uh, a targeted response came in the temporary employment relief scheme that, that offered through the companies some subsidization of, of uh, the wage costs to prevent companies from laying off their workers through the UIF, through, through the normal channels, uh, the official channels, if you like. Uh, there, was also, there were also some company uh, tax delays, et cetera, also targeted at the formal sector. Uh, but, but, and, uh, um, and those were implemented uh, and could be implemented because the administrative systems were in place. So the big conundrum then was, okay, but what about the inform more casualized parts of the workforce uh, and the informal sector in which those administrative systems are just absolutely not there? And, and so the design of, of those, of, of us working with our data, just profiling our data was actually to see, okay, if we top up the existing social grants, would they reach those informalized work, workers? We need some. We need. Uh, we need a connection between our existing social grants because that's eminently doable. You can top up your grants. Very good. Um, very good system in South Africa of, of administering these social grants. They're not means tested. They're not complicated. Um, and uh, and it turned out that they would reach many of the informalized workers because they are in the. They are in vulnerable families. 
and uh, and so one of the one of the innovations of the South African grant system was simply to top up those grants, and that was a it was a success. It worked, but that still left us with a conundrum to try and work out. Okay, but there's certain you, you know the, in in the in the sort of third, fourth, and fifth deciles, there's extremely vulnerable workers who aren't going to be reached by by that. And so what do you do? And so the country designed some emergency administrative procedures where people, where these workers could apply for uh, what was called the Social Relief of Distress Grant, pitched extremely low, uh, about a third of the poverty line, actually 350 rand uh, per person, um, could apply. And, and they put administrative systems in place. It took about six weeks to do that. Um, and, uh, and put this grant in place for the first time in the country ever at the working age population, targeted at them. It, it wasn't perfect, uh, it's very low, but the evidence implied it was amazing what South Africans did with 350 Rand a month in coping with the pandemic. It was absolutely key. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the, the one area where the country was really caught with us pants down and we let our people down quite badly is that we don't have a food system. And that contrasts greatly with other countries. We have school feeding, that's about it. And then we have civil society that's very involved on the food side. So in terms of dealing with the hunger, we did extremely poorly. In, in particular, because government was, was quite reticent in its approach to the pandemic to actually integrate with civil society and all hands on deck and let's see what we can do. They wanted to run the policy, but we have an absence of a policy about food. So I think that, you, you know, so that's the terrain. So we did pretty well on, and quite innovatively on these, on these grants and, and cash, um, and, uh, and the fact that it was a pandemic seemed to free up the political space so that they just got on and designed these interventions and didn't worry so much about the long run tax side of the, of, uh, of the thing. And, and the evidence was that we really did, the grants really did help with poverty alleviation and, and food and nutrition and hunger in particular, but, um, but on the direct food support, we did extremely badly. I'll stop there for now, Ravi, and we can come back later. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed, Murray, for that uh, in-depth uh, uh, in-depth look at uh, the South African uh, South African case. Um, let me let me actually suggest to both to Joe and, and Murray that we that we go into a uh, an audience session now to see get some re reactions and so on, uh, because there is another question that I wanted to put to the panel, which which we'll get round to, and actually the audience can also uh, talk about this, which is. What was what will be your wish list in terms of pieces of analysis that, we, that you would want to do so that you could, we could be better ready for the next crisis uh, in South Africa and uh, in, 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 of course, uh, uh, other countries in Zambia, Ethiopia and so on. So let, let's uh, let's invite uh, members of the audience now to uh, to make to make their comments. If you could uh, indicate that you want to speak, uh, then then you can uh, uh, you can be uh, uh, led into the led into the uh, uh, speak. Yes, so we have a uh, Radwa. Radwa, please uh, introduce yourself and uh, and say a few words, and then God's power after that. Radwa. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Radwa Bushaidi. I'm from Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, I am working as a consultant mainly in social policies. Uh, so this topic is really interesting for me because our countries unfortunately share almost the same threats and same challenges. During COVID, we can say in the first phase of the first year, um, 2020, um, our government was taking this social protection very seriously because um, there was an adoption of uh, a structural reform program, which already negatively affecting the poor people. So the poor was not ready for another crisis. And unfortunately, around 45% of the uh, workers are in the informal sector which makes them more vulnerable. However, the government started to make like a recording and uh, provide them with cash transfer for around six months. It was a um, yani, very small uh, amount of money. However, it was a great step because it was the first time to collect the data about workers in the informal sector. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, we can say a package of uh, social policies adopted in 
especially in 2020. However, due to the, this recent um, uh, war in Ukraine and the food security problem in Egypt, uh, and also um, different inflation due to also the, we, you can imagine that we make, it, um, we can say depreciation of our currency in front of the dollar twice this year, and we are expecting the third one. So all of these, uh, because we, we, we need a lot of foreign currency exchange due to all of the threats within the couple of years before. So we are negotiating with the IMF to have another uh, loan, which, which unfortunately will make the thing, things worse for the poor people. That's why we are, yeah, we should, the government should make some consideration about the poor. Uh, how can, for example, we make some of the formalizing and all of these uh, stuff? This was like a, a, a small brief about the current situation in, in Egypt. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Radwa, for that, for the ex experience from uh, Egypt. So let's move on to God's power now. And then after that, uh, Jose. And then Shaka. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's Mr. God's power from Nigeria, West Africa. This topic is very Apt social protection. And my question is, is this, I am um, SDGs uh, volunteer, specifically for uh, SDGs 8, uh, 1, 2, and 4. Uh, it's very important to us in West Africa, Nigeria. Now, in you look at the economic um, financial circle, you see that it is those at the survival circle. You know, the poor are people that usually suffer, suffer from this and don't, uh, this don't really work for them. And then you look at, uh, that is West Africa now. And then you look at uh, East Africa, you look at South Sudan because of uh, also the, the crisis. Uh, so the question is, how do we, you know, implement this? How would this apply to the survival level? Uh, uh, people in the survival economic level um, in Nigeria and um, in South Sudan, because they are, the, for instance, in Nigeria, um, but in the next few months, elections are fast approaching. And those at the survival economic level at the grassroots are the worst it. And this topic is very up, it's coming at the right time, it's very important. So it's very critical. How does this apply? How will this apply in practical terms and, and how sustainable it will be the application? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Godspa. Uh, let's move to Jose and then uh, Shakar after that. Jose? Uh, uh, thanks, Rabbit. Uh, good morning, everyone. Congratulations for this meeting. Uh, I am Jose from Venezuela. I am PhD at Dauphin University. I am working for different international organizations with ATAF mm -hmm. and tax inspector we had boarded as a roster. I, I think in, in Latin American area, inequality is one of the principal issues. I think we, we need to rescind the international tax system. Uh, maybe the OCD initiative of Pillar 2, I think is, uh, is a good project to try to, to, to eliminate tax incentive because I think 6% 6, 6 of GDP of, of in Latin America area is based in tax incentives also. Uh, we need to 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 improve uh, BAT collation for digital tax savers. I think the different initiative, is the OCD, Inter-American Development Bank, ATF, is is a good option to try to to collect more more, more ink, more revenue to tr to try to to give uh, the different technical assistance for the poor people. I think. Uh, in this moment, I think we 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 live in in a uh, in a crisis. I think we, we I think also to rethink the international tax environment to try to 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 improve the different uh, social system in our country. Many thanks, Ravi. Great, thank you very much indeed, Jose. So, Shaka, you had your hand up. Would you like to go now? Oh yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ravi. And uh, I have a question for Mari. Could you, could, you, could, you, could you introduce is, yourself, please? Okay, my name is Shaka Bob, and I'm a doctoral candidate at uh, Stellenbosch University, Department of uh, Sociology. Okay, thank and, you. And uh, it's good to see you, Mari. <laughs> and um, I've got a question for Mari because he's been speaking about the special COVID-19 grant. But however, the special COVID-19 COVID grant is going to come to an end, I think, March 2023. And there have been calls for 
for the introduction of a basic income grant. So civil society has been raising this voice about a basic income grant in South Africa. My question to Mary is, how viable is this grant? You know, if we introduce a basic income grant to replace the special COVID-19 grant. So I'd like to hear about the viability. Thank you. Are there any other questions from uh, members of the audience before we before we have a second round? Please put your hands up if you if you if you'd like to uh, uh, contribute to this with your with your country experience or your uh, analytical perspective on this. Okay, so then let me uh, uh, let me then just throw it back to the panelists and also actually to Yuka with this, with a second round of questions. Then Murray, you can respond to the specific question on South Africa as well when 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 we come to you. Uh, it's the following, you know, uh, Murray gave a great detail about how uh, uh, South Africa did uh, well or not, didn't do well with respect to this specific crisis, the COVID crisis. And he said we were caught with our pants down in, 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 in these areas, etc. Uh, but of course, there'll be, there'll, there'll be the next crisis won't be this one. Uh, and actually, we don't know what the next crisis will be. <laughs> it could be some refugee type thing because something blows up somewhere. It could be a financial meltdown, some, any, any of these things. How do we think about that uh, in terms of being ready for the next crisis when we don't know what the next crisis is going to be? That's the question I want to pose to you. But, but more generally, what are the specific pieces of analysis that you would like to, that you would like to see now in order to get us ready for uh, the next crisis? So uh, let's go to Joy, then Murray, then Yuka, and then maybe members of the audience can also uh, chip in. Just put your hands up uh, if you want to speak. Joya? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I think like, well, that's what the problem, uh, with, uh, what you were saying, Ravi, we don't know what the what the next crisis will be. So it's difficult to, to, to think of different types of, uh, of responses, because they, they would be specific to each crisis. So in that sense, I think like, I think we still need to solve and that would solve many issues, how we reach these universal basic floors. Once we, 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 we have managed to do that, which is a very uh, challenging thing to do, then well, we, 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 have a, we have a basic floor to start with. No? Uh, so we will be better prepared for, for, for the next crisis. That's my first uh, point. And so the questions and the research I, I would mention are linked to, to that. But then second, one crisis that we would for sure know it will happen is climate change and, and all climate uh, change disasters. Uh, so in that sense, I think, yes, uh, the, the, the type of social protection response that we need to design re to, uh, to, to respond to this type of crisis uh, uh, would be very specific. So we need some more research on that uh, specific aspect that we know it will happen. Uh, so those were, would be my two big points. Mm -hmm. Now, coming back to how to reach these universal basic floors, as I was saying before, I think we, we have two big questions, how to achieve universal coverage in terms of the design of social protection schemes. And by this, I, I wonder like, well, should countries uh, focus on expanding coverage from contributory schemes subsidized by the government, what we what some countries call matching contributions, or should they uh, just focus on, on expanding non-contributory programs? My, my, my initial response would be, well, it depends on, on, on the starting point of this country, whether there is a, a pre-existing significant share of population covered by contributory schemes or not. Uh, but in, in any case, we need research about that. And then, any of these options uh, will, will, will require significant uh, funding for this. So then the second big question is how to finance these universal uh, basic floors. Uh, Uno Wider is doing some research. The OECD is also doing some research on that, but we need a lot of uh, research on the topic because it's very challenging. Like the, the ILO has estimated that for low-income countries the, to cover these basic uh, floors, they would need additional 16% of their GDP, low income countries. So it's a huge gap that we need to, to finance. Uh, so, well, then I have a couple of, of, of ideas of what we are uh, considering in terms of measures, but coming back to the, to the, the specific um, 
list of for pieces of analysis, I think there, it would be very important to carry out an impact evaluation of, of different matching contribution initiatives. For example, in Malaysia, Indonesia, there are many countries that are, are doing this. Whether these, these, these uh, programs are, are succeeding in permanently increasing contributory coverage. Uh, and then also, well, other other countries that have what that have managed that they, they are following uh, an, an, a, an, a strategy to cover uh, the population via non-contributory schemes. How this has fun functioned, uh, whether this has uh, had an impact on formalization or not, uh, and then especially which countries that I think case studies are very important. Which countries are have succeeded in raising revenue? significant revenue. I don't know, like, for example, we have studied, there are very few countries that have managed to, to raise additional 5% of GDP in, in tax revenues in the last 10 years. And the, the amounts of funding that we need to cover so, for, for social protection floors is immense. So it would be very interesting to, to, to study uh, specific cases that have been successful in doing so. So in terms like, and, and this, uh, well, Jose was mentioning, but there are many, many uh, strategies that we need to pursue in terms of uh, raising uh, uh, revenues. I think that this should, these strategies should be short-term, medium-term and long-term, but they span through all the tax system. We need to review tax expenditures. We need to review capital and income uh, and capital and labor income taxation. Uh, we need to fight tax evasion, but especially uh, among the rich. Uh, we, and, and we need to start uh, evaluating alternatives for tax in the rich in countries where uh, capital income taxation has not, has not, been, uh, has not uh, been effective, like the case of Chile, like the case of Colombia. So exploring inheritance taxation uh, uh, and other property taxes, um, net wealth taxes, for example, uh, and we also need to uh, evaluate reforming fossil fuels and environmental taxation. Of course, these are uh, very uh, regressive uh, taxes, but we need to complement with compensatory uh, mechanisms and ensure, and ensure that then the whole tax and transfer uh, system related to that is progressive in the end. And same start, uh, holds for VAT. We, we, once we have uh, good social registries, one we can compensate uh, the, the, the most vulnerable effectively, then we can start reforming VAT tax expenditures, but making sure we compensate the most vulnerable. That would be among the, the big ideas on, on, on how to finance uh, uh, these gaps. But I think there is a lot of research needed and, 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 and especially case studies, impact analysis of these uh, new uh, programs that are being, that are being uh, introduced. Thank you. Well, well, I would be shocked if a, a group of researchers didn't say that there was more research needed. But uh, Murray, I, I wonder whether you'll say that less research is needed. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but I do think that there's, there's definitely some very, very key uh, issues. Um, Whatever the shock, uh, whether it's climate change or, uh, it's clear to me that 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 COVID has pushed us into into uh, needing to understand the connections between the economy and the labour market and the private sector and the social protection system as an as an interface together. Because obviously the viability of the social protection system, even in the in the normal, if you if you like in a livelihood tracking sense, the viability, if your employment creation is going really well and the economy is booming, you want, you want the social protection, people to be gra uh, graduating out of the social protection system. So you need, there's huge issues around designing this interface and, you know, and, and designing a, a nuanced flow, both within government and how their, pro their programs mm -hmm. interlock with each other, because that's crucial for targeting too, uh, but especially this connection between uh, support that is needed for the type of unemployed people that we have, not just in South Africa, but everywhere. And the, and the fact that the bounce back from COVID is not the same people getting the same jobs. There's a lot of restructuring going on in the labor market. You need to understand that and design your protection system so that you're supporting people um, 
in a way that when they do integrate into the labor market, they graduate out of the system. That's key to the sustainability of, of the system, uh, I feel. Uh, and even key to designing basic income support. So if you come to this argument about universalism uh, versus targeted interventions, et cetera, given the fiscal constraints, it's very hard to see how people, th that the standard argument for basic income grant, if you like, um, is going to win the day in most African economies. It's really a sort of a, a tailored intervention, certainly in the South African context, to, to come back to Shaka's question, it's a tailored intervention about whether this, this country needs something for, uh, for the working age population. Um, and uh, and given the support of the social relief of distress, the, the, the success, uh, my answer would be that we, we do actually uh, need something, but it needs to be integrated with, with the texture of South African unemployment so that you know very clearly, is this the long-term unemployed? Is this more akin to poverty alleviation, but with good links to the labor market? Or is this temporary support for, for workers that are, that are likely to, to become employed and can graduate out of the system. Um, so that's, that's, that's my, my one key point. Uh, the, the country as, as part of its, uh, this is infrastructure. This is social infrastructure. There's just no way through. I completely agree with, with you and, and you can, and everybody. It's become part of the discussion. Um, the, the one point that I had to, wanted to make as well, related to the basic income support, is that you have to focus on the tax side. The civil society voice often is, is not really willing to look at the costing, or only in a very flip way, like in South Africa, okay, but let's impose some wealth taxes. Yes, but if you really do a hard look at the wealth tax side, it's not going to generate the revenue that we need. Um, to, 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 to do this. So you have to look at the tax side. So what about the research? Well, I want to put in an advertorial, if you like, for, for the type of work that Yuk has introduced us to, to the SA mod or the CEQ, you know, the benefit incidence exercises, um, but with better links to the labor market side. Uh, I, I think it's absolutely crucial because you do need to play out some realistic scenarios with even in the civil society engagement. Even, you, you know, to, to, uh, to show, for example, in, in the South African case, if you change a targeting rule in a small way, the, 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 the reach of a grant doubles or halves, right? And so then you need to be able to look at the poverty impacts of that and you need to be able to look at the tax implications of that. So these integrated models, I think, are absolutely uh, crucial to have in place. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you very much indeed, Murray. We're, we're, we, only, we only have two minutes left. And in those two minutes, I'd like to turn to uh, Yuka to say some, uh, to say some concluding, concluding words and, uh, and bring this to a conclusion. Yuka. Thank you. I don't know if I managed to do that, but um, let me first of all, I mean, also thank you. Uh, uh, thank uh, both uh, Joya and, and Murray. Uh, excellent points you made and um, agree. I agree with uh, what, what what's been said. So um, so three points really. Um, uh, so the first is the, um, I think there has to be more analysis on the, on the suitability of various various systems depending on the country circumstances. So uh, it might be might not be the case that the uh, that the the African countries cannot, uh, apart from South Africa perhaps um, uh, and maybe some others, cannot implement. A completely universal system, but perhaps they could implement more uh, uh, more universal systems than they currently run. So targeted to certain uh, population groups, like uh, households with uh, with many children or, or the end. And analyzing this, I mean, uh, the suitability of of, of, the, of the of the systems, depending on the country circumstances, this is one. And the second one, I think, I mean, is linking linking to the financing of the of these more universal systems. So looking at the tax side, and then I, I think one of the one of the messages there is that we need to look at the the tax benefit system as a whole. So not all taxes need to be progressive. Uh, it's sufficient if the system as a whole is is is, is sufficiently pro progressive. And then perhaps some financing scope as 
Joy already said, can be found from, from the indirect taxa. Uh, in order to benefit from these new uh, corporate income tax arrangements, I think developing countries really need support uh, in terms of mobilizing those resources. So there, uh, perhaps technical collaboration may help. And finally, I think we can we have made quite a bit of advances in the area of uh, utilizing administrative tax data for tax reasons. And I think there could be more possibilities of also merging various administrative data sets to have a more complete picture of, of not only the tax side, but also the benefit side. So that, that's also something that some of the countries at least uh, uh, can, uh, can, can enjoy. But really, I mean, that, those were my, my concluding comments. So back to you, Ravi. No, that's uh, that, thank you very much indeed. Uh, a huge thanks to our panelists, Joya and, uh, and Murray, uh, and to uh, the, the, the whole wider team for organizing this. And of course, thanks to our audience for, uh, uh, for joining us and for your, for your comments and observations. So with that, let us conclude this, uh, this session. Thank you very much. Safe journeys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye then. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.